Join me tonight on Twitch at 11.30 p.m. Eastern after the conclusion of Sunday Night Football, where we'll talk about everything that happened this week in the NFL. And join me Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern to play some live NFL trivia for a chance to win cash prizes. Link in the description below. And now, on with our feature presentation. Dan Reeves is one of the most successful coaches in the history of the National Football League. You'd be hard-pressed to find too many coaches that have as good of a resume as he does. He has the 10th most wins of any coach in NFL history, has the 10th most playoff wins of any coach in NFL history, is one of just 8 coaches in NFL history to make it to the Super Bowl 4 times, and when you factor in his career as a player and as an assistant coach, he made it to a staggeringly high 9 Super Bowls. For some perspective, if you picked a random Super Bowl, there is about a 1 in 6 chance that you will pick a Super Bowl that involved Dan Reeves in some capacity. It's amazing just how much he accomplished in his time on Earth. And yet, it was dangerously close to not being this way. Because what you might not realize about Dan Reeves is that back in 1987, before he won two AP Coach of the Year awards, before he won three more conference championships, and before he won another 100 some odd games, he was moments away from retiring and walking away from the sport forever. He was done with the NFL, and he was done with coaching. And it's entirely possible that one game against the Los Angeles Raiders in 1987 changed all of that, and changed his mind completely. And this is the story behind the game that might have saved Dan Reeves' career from ending prematurely. Before I talk about the game in question, we need some context to understand how well the Broncos were doing before the game, as well as the kind of shaky landscape of the NFL heading into this affair. Entering the 1987 season, the Denver Broncos were coming off of what was arguably their most successful season yet. They finished the year with an 11-5 record, winning the AFC West. They built off of a successful regular season with two playoff wins, including the first road playoff win in franchise history when they defeated the Cleveland Browns in the AFC Championship, and they advanced to Super Bowl 21, making it to their second Super Bowl in franchise history before falling at the hands of the New York Giants. In 1986, the Broncos were a really good team, and they were looking to avoid the dreaded Super Bowl hangover in 1987. Turns out, it seemed like through the first two weeks, they did not have to worry about that because to start off the 1987 season, the Broncos picked up right where they left off. They were unbeaten through two weeks after crushing the Seattle Seahawks 40-17 at home in Week 1, and after tying the Green Bay Packers on the road on a wet and gross day in Milwaukee by a final score of 17 all. Denver's offense was great in 1986, finishing 6th in points scored and being led by one of the top quarterbacks in football in the legendary John Elway. But in 1987, it seemed like they were almost unstoppable to start things off, as over those first two weeks, the Broncos picked up an astonishingly high 982 yards of total offense, or 491 yards a game on average. Once again, the Broncos were looking like the team to beat. They were one of just three teams in the AFC to not have a loss after two weeks. Their 57 points scored was the third most in the NFL, only behind the Buffalo Bills at 62 and the Seattle Seahawks at 60. Their defense was great too, allowing just 34 points through the first two weeks, giving them the fourth fewest points allowed in the league and the second fewest in the AFC, only behind the Los Angeles Raiders who had somehow only given up 7 by this point. Their well-balanced team with a stacked offense and defense gave them a point differential of plus 23, which was the third highest in the NFL, only behind the Chicago Bears at 32 and the Los Angeles Raiders at 40. And considering how successful they had been lately, having finished with a winning record in each of the past four seasons, and having finished with a winning percentage of 73% over the past three seasons, it didn't seem like anything was going to stop them. The only thing that could stop the Broncos seemed like it was going to be the NFL itself. And then the strike happened. In 1987, following the second week of the season, the players went on strike. It was the second time this decade that the league had to pause play for a bit because of players striking, as this happened during the 1982 season just five years before. And now that the 1982 collective bargaining agreement expired, and the players were unable to come to an agreement with the owners on what the next CBA should look like, mainly regarding the issues of free agency and revenue distribution, the players went on strike, which canceled week three of the season. This was just the second time in the near 70-year history of the NFL at this point that the league paused play midway through. However, this time, unlike the 1982 strike, where play was shut down for nearly two months, the owners were going to play on. They were not going to allow another major interruption of the season to occur. And with that, as long as the strike went on, the teams would be filled by replacement players known as scabs. I'm not going to dive too much into the fine details of the strike, since there are many great resources out there, as well as a very good 30 for 30 documentary from a few years ago. But I did a video on one of these scab games and scab players already, so if you want to learn more about that, click the card in the upper right corner. But this meant that as long as the NFLPA was striking, Dan Reeves and the Denver Broncos would have to make do without the likes of John Elway, Carl Mecklenburg, and Vance Johnson, just to name a few. The result of the first scab game that Reeves and the Broncos played? It was a disaster. 
There was no surviving footage of the game available, but let's just say it was not pretty, as in a home matchup against the Houston Oilers, the Broncos were to get pummeled and would lose 40-10. After averaging over 181 rushing yards over the first two games, the replacement Broncos would put up just 38 in this game on an abysmal 2.3 yards per carry. Denver threw three interceptions and fumbled three times, and no quarterback that the Broncos put back there, whether it was Ken Karcher, Dean May, or Monty McGuire, had any success. Combined, the three men completed just 48% of their passes while taking five sacks and posting a passer rating of 43.4. And after yet another work stoppage, and after seeing just how abysmal and pathetic the scab Broncos were, Dan Reeves was ready to hang it up and say goodbye to the sport that he loved. Dan Reeves was a head coach for 23 years, and in 1987, he was working on his seventh season in the NFL. The worst record of his career came in 1982. That season, after the Broncos went 10 and 6, things looked like they were going to be promising. The Broncos started out 1 and 1, with one of these wins even being against the defending Super Bowl champion San Francisco 49ers. It seemed like Denver was picking up right where they left off after a solid 1981 campaign. However, after that game, the strike happened, and when the strike was over, the Broncos were the team that took the hardest beating. Denver was not ready to play after two months off, and the Broncos went just 1 and 6 over the final seven games to finish with a 2 and 7 record only ahead of the Baltimore Colts at 0-8-1 and the Houston Oilers at 1-8 for the worst record in all of football. Reeves went through that nightmare, and after witnessing something that I'm sure a lot of people wouldn't even call football during the scab game against the Oilers, Reeves was contemplating hanging it up. He thought that the future for the NFL was bleak, that this labor unrest was never going to end, and to be frank, he wanted no part of it, saying on the unrest, I knew there was no hope. As Reeves later said in the press conference, there has been a strike at the end of the last three or four contracts. It seems like sometimes it's always a one-way street, where there's a lot to give, but you never get anything in return. He was disgusted at how bad the Broncos looked, and how this was not the team he thought he was going to have, saying something that started out very bright with a big win over Seattle, certainly three or four weeks later, is very frustrating. And just to emphasize that this was not general frustration after a blowout loss, he bluntly said that the strike was making him rethink his future in the NFL. One week of scab games was not enough to end the strike or stop the season. The NFL was going to carry on, and was going to power through with the replacement players. And with that, we head to Mile High Stadium for a nationally televised Monday Night Football game. It's October 12, 1987, and we have an AFC West matchup on our hands between the Broncos and the Raiders. I would usually say that the whole football world was watching, since this is a Monday Night Football game and the stakes are amplified by being on national television and whatnot, but let's be honest, the ratings for the scab games were pretty abysmal. Still, this was an important game for the Broncos. The Raiders are 3-0, and, and the Broncos are 1-1-1. One, one one. So if the Broncos lose, they drop the two and a half games out of first after the first four games of the year, and they don't have the tiebreaker. The task was big. They had to play the only undefeated team in the AFC, and one of just two undefeated teams in football along with the Chicago Bears. If the Broncos got pummeled, based off of everything that Reeves said and based off of what he went through during the 1982 strike, he was more likely than not going to step away from the game and retire. But as fate would have it, this would not be Dan Reeves' last game. Not even close. The game started out absolutely swimmingly for the Broncos, as they scored two rushing touchdowns in the first quarter, taking a 14-0 lead after 15 minutes. Considering the fact that the Raiders entered this game as 11-point favorites, this hot start was a shocker, especially considering the egg that the Broncos laid the previous week against the Oilers. Both touchdowns were scored by Joe Dudek, who scored from 7 yards out and 3 yards out. These were the only two touchdowns that Dudek ever scored in his career. Fun fact about Dudek, he was one of the players who crossed the picket line and joined the Broncos for this game. When asked why he did it, he said, I stayed out as long as I could, but my bank account was down to nothing, and I had hit rock bottom in my financial situation. Even though the Raiders were tied up later in the first half, thanks to a 3-yard receiving touchdown by Mario Perry and a 55-yard punt return touchdown by Rick Calhoun, the Broncos took a 17-14 lead going into the half. And in the second half, the defense held strong. Rick Massey caught a 10-yard touchdown in the third quarter from Ken Karcher, and Nathan Hull punched it in from one yard out in the fourth quarter, all while the defense pitched a second-half shutout. When the final whistle sounded, to the shock of just about every football fan watching, it was the Denver Broncos who came out on top, winning this one by a final score of 30-14, and sending the over 61,000 fans at mile high into a frenzy. Yes, that is an insanely and unusually high number for scab games. This was one of the only scab games that was played in a stadium that didn't look like a barren wasteland. Denver dominated this game in every sense of the word. They forced the Raiders to turn it over five times. They doubled the Raiders' rushing total outgaining them 204 to 102 on the ground. The Broncos averaged 2.3 yards per carry against the Oilers, but in this game against their division rival, they more than doubled that, averaging over 4.7 yards per carry. 
And after the game, Reeves spoke positively on his team and on the crowd, which was the largest scab crowd at the time, surpassing the previous high set by the Cowboys the previous day by more than 20,000 fans. Reeves said, It has to be a factor when you've got a crowd like that behind you. And after that game, judging by the fans and judging by how well his team played, Reeves realized that everything was going to be okay. He was not going to retire, and he was not going to walk away from the sport. And the rest is history. One more scab game was played before the Broncos' actual roster came back, and when play resumed as normal, the Broncos resumed as one of the best teams in all of football. Over the final two months of the season, the Broncos won seven of their nine games, finishing the season with a 10-4-1 record in the abbreviated 15-game campaign, winning the AFC West for the second straight year, and making it to the Super Bowl for the second straight year and for the third time in franchise history. As a side note, I did a video on one of the playoff games that they played in to get to the Super Bowl that year, so if you want to learn more about their divisional round game against the Houston Oilers, where they won convincingly using their actual roster this time, then click the card in the upper right corner. And I think it's safe to say that Dan Reeves had way more to get to the game after that 1987 season. He was just getting started. He led the Broncos to another Super Bowl in 1989, when they made it to Super Bowl 24 and made it to their third championship game in four years, creating somewhat of a mini-dynasty in the AFC. Then he went on to coach the New York Giants for four years, leading them to the postseason in 1993, being named the AP Coach of the Year that year for the first time ever, and leading the team on one of the most remarkable in-season turnarounds ever in 1994, when they went from 3-7 to 9-7. If you want to learn more about how great of a coach Reeves was, and how he somehow pulled that off, click the card in the upper right corner. And then he coached the Atlanta Falcons for seven seasons, and in 1998, not only won AP Coach of the Year again, but guided Atlanta to their first Super Bowl appearance in franchise history, when they made it to Super Bowl 33 before falling to the Denver Broncos. And it's truly amazing how none of this happens, and just how different NFL history looks, if the Broncos lose that game against the Raiders. If the Broncos lay an egg like they did against the Oilers, and Reeves sees another season go down the tubes like he saw in 1982 due to labor unrest, Reeves likely would have walked away, and would not have stayed with the Broncos or in professional football knowing that every few years, a work stoppage was bound to happen and mess everything up and derail his season. That scab game on Monday Night Football had more impact on the long-term history of the NFL than anyone truly knew at the time, because without it, we would have lost one of the greatest coaches in the history of the sport way too soon. Get your official Jaguar Gamer 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes, link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JRGator9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See so how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.